with what sometimes we call the prosperity gospel coming from what about uh, 800 years ago or so some people want to see god with their eyes as they see a cow and to love him as they love a cow for the milk and cheese and profit it brings them this is how it is with people who love god for the sake of outward wealth or inward comfort they do not rightly love god when they love him for their own advantage we're thinking about it, isn't it and, and isn't it true that the book of, of revelation it it wants to inspire us to prompt us to to nudge us to to love our lord and god because he's worthy of our love and, and praise not just because of what we can get out of it and maybe it chides me as a bible teacher and a minister of the gospel that sometimes do do i sometimes appeal to to less than the best motives to encourage people in their relationship with the lord we're thinking about another quote and i think this ties in well with the messages to the seven churches some of which if we were looking at last week had rather strong words but you tolerate this woman jezebel and i have this against you and, and actually most of the churches have a, a message of, of rebuke to them we are not saved by what we do but by who we know however who we know will be visible in what we do isn't that wrong? That biblical the fruit of the spirit is what come along with me love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance so those things god wants them to be visible in our lives does he not and so what we do reveals who we know as we live our lives day by day well we're turning to our study for today and i was thinking about how to what title to give to this and it struck me these two of the three churches and i'm not going to to chide bob hamilton and say i threw the short straw but you know there are seven churches and some of you you've been studying this you maybe know that of the seven churches there are two of the seven churches that that receive no statement of approval no commendation we might say and those two are both in my section <laughs> so i don't know if that's fitting or not but sardis and laodicea are the two churches that receive no commendation and and so i got three and i got two of those three but have you considered it this way before that the opposite of love is not hatred or criticizing or something the opposite of love is, is apathy and indifference isn't it and the fact that the lord rebukes these churches counsels them it, it lets us know that he cares enough about them and, and then i noticed also in both churches six and seven in the church of philadelphia we'll be reading this in a few minutes but you'll notice that in Revelation 3, verse 9, Revelation 3, verse 9, the last phrase there says, they will learn that I have loved you. There's the word love. And then over in Revelation 3, verse 19, maybe the strongest letter of all, those whom I, what does it say? Those whom I love prove discipline. So whatever challenges might exist in the, the lives of these early believers, it is clear, is it not, that God loves them. And he's inviting them into a deeper relationship and a closer fellowship with himself. So Jesus' letters are concerned to people whom he loves. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we take up our study. Lord, many times when we read your word, we find it reading us, reading our hearts and our lives, ourselves. So we ask that you will guide this study today. Speak to us with messages that we need to hear, just as you spoke to those ancient Christians so long ago. In the name of Jesus, who loves us so much, we pray. Amen.
So just a little review, my colleagues have done an excellent job introducing the seven churches and outlining the, the studies. And you may have noticed that you could go on the postal route from Ephesus, which was at the coast at that time, interestingly enough, just for your information, and I had the privilege of traveling to these sites just a few weeks ago. Ephesus is now several miles from the coast because silt coming out from the river has, has filled in the area there. So ancient Ephesus is not on the coast anymore. So you see Ephesus, then go north to Smyrna, modern Izmir, then up to Pergamum, and then you head inland to Thyatira, Philadelphia, and, excuse me, Thyatira, uh, Pergamon, then you go Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So an ancient postal carrier would have followed that route in going from place to place. And then a few questions that, that will give us, I, I guess, a foundation for this lesson that we're considering. And these aren't things that we have any final answer to, but I'd like you to think about it in connection with our study of Revelation. What do you think a letter from Jesus to the College Dell Church would say? Think about it. What if it was a letter? It was to the College Dell Church. What, what would that letter say? What would it emphasize? What rebuke might it offer? What commendation might it give? Well, you know, it's a little easier to think about something that's more broad because we all know people, right, in the church that they need counsel and <laughs> rebuke. And probably for us personally, we would warrant the commendation, right? <laughs> At least that's what we maybe like to think. But let's narrow it down a little bit. How about a letter from Jesus to the good news? So I'm still class. Starts to get a little closer to home, doesn't it? Oh, how about a letter to your family or to you personally? So would your hands be trembling a little bit if there was a, a letter that showed up in your box and it, it wasn't just spam or a spoof, it, it was actually from the one who does know all about us and know our work. How would you feel? You open such a letter. Eager, maybe to see what the Lord says. Anxious, perhaps a little nervous. And and I guess what I want to emphasize is that, in a sense, is it not true that these letters are addressed to us? Because I believe that our all-knowing Lord looked down through the ages and the centuries, and He recognized what churches nowadays would be grappling with. And while I think there is an application of the church at Laodicea to the church of the last days in a special way, I think it's also true that there are Christians in the world nowadays who have lost their first love, like at Ephesus. There are people that are facing severe threat of persecution for worshiping today in some parts of the world, like the Christians at Smyrna, and so forth going through the churches in other words these letters do speak to us and i think of something that i believe it was donna duff that said last week turn with me to deuteronomy chapter 32 deuteronomy chapter 32 she made an insightful comment and we were talking about why is it that the christians are condemned for or not uh, for tolerating Jezebel and for engaging in immoral practices and this type of thing. Why are they condemned? And, and she made the point that, that their lives depended on their response to these letters. And I thought about it, and maybe to amplify it a little further, isn't it true that Scripture would not just say that your life depends on it, but your eternity depends on it? Look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 46. Moses, in giving his valedictory message, his, his parting speech, so to speak, Deuteronomy 32, 46, he said to them, take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today 
that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. Verse 47, for it is no empty word for you, but what does the next phrase say? This is your life. Boy, if you're sending your son or daughter off to academy or college and you have a final word with them, your, your life depends on this. You want them to listen carefully, don't you? You want them to understand, to, to take to heart, these words are not idle words for you, but they are your life. So as we look at the letters to these three churches today, let's keep that in mind. Just a little review of some things that apply to all the seven letters before we look at our three in particular. First point, I, I would like for us to keep in mind, and maybe this is self-evident to all of you, but I, I want us to keep in mind sometimes nowadays when we think of a church, we think of a building, oh, I'm going to the church for this. But when you're writing a letter to the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Philadelphia, wherever, these are the believers, the Christians of these communities. It's not talking about a building. So it, it's writing to people who are there, people like us in this room this morning. And then what about the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, in some ways, that sort of sounds self-evident, doesn't it? We all, have, we all have ears. But isn't it true that in the Bible, more than that is implied? Have you read several places in the Bible before where you have verses like, having eyes, they see not. Having ears, they do not hear. Is it possible for us to have physical ears but not be really listening? A story about myself that is it's a very affirming story that uh, God forgives even the mistakes that we make as parents sometimes and I, I'm sure this happened more than once but one time I was on a walk with my children and I was deep in thought about something that I thought was important at that time and one of my sons was talking to me uh, telling me about something and I was just going have you done this before uh-huh uh-huh uh-huh. And finally, he called me out on the, you know, your children do this to you sometimes. Dad, you're not listening. And what do you say when you know they're right? Uh, you're not listening. Isn't it true that sometimes we, we have ears, but, but we don't listen to what the Lord wants to, to tell us? And so I, I would just remind us that in Scripture, what is represented, what the, the listening ear represents, is it represents a willing heart. And, and, and where does that heart come from? Let's turn to Ezekiel 36 quickly. Ezekiel 36. A beautiful promise there. 36, verse 26. And I will give you a what? A new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I remember, I think it was in the late 1960s, sometime we were getting ready to go to school and listening on the radio and the news flashed across the radio that Dr. Christian Bernard of South Africa had performed the first heart transplant. And for me as a, as a boy, I just felt this was incredible news that they'd actually taken a heart out of someone who, who was, was dying and put it in someone who had a heart that was not functioning correctly and that he was still alive. The one that had received the heart. But the news of scripture is that God has been performing heart transplants long ago, has he not? In fact, maybe a better word would be a heart implant because it's not another stony, rebellious human heart, but a heart that is receptive to his will. A new heart I will give you. And while you're in that section of scripture, turn quickly to Jeremiah 24. In fact, I think this is a promise that's worth claiming 
for individuals that don't seem receptive to spiritual things at this time. Maybe you have some loved ones, relatives that you're praying for. Look at Jeremiah 24, verse 7. And I will do what? I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Isn't that a beautiful promise? The, the heart comes from God. It's his gift. I will give them their heart to know me, that I am the Lord. Um, also, you'll notice a repeated theme is, I know your what? I know your word. You know, when you first start dating somebody, and, and maybe with all of us, there are a few things about ourselves that we're maybe not as eager for them to find out. And isn't it isn't the thought that runs through our mind, will, will they still like me if they if they know this about me, that I'm I'm chronically late or or I like strange foods or, or whatever it might be. Will they still like me? But you know, the wonderful thing is is the Lord knows all about us. And, and still loves us. I, I know your words. And, and we probably all heard ministers say many times, God loves us just the way we are. But I wonder if it's not more theologically correct, I'm not denying that, but maybe not more theologically correct to say God loves us, listen carefully, God loves us despite the way we are. Isn't that true? I mean, in, in the Bible, God says of Jesus' his son, you are my beloved son, and you, I am well pleased. I know there are times in my life that I've done things that are not pleasing to God. And, and the wonderful truth of the gospel is that, that the Lord loves me despite how I am, and he sends his spirit to transform and empower me to live a life in harmony with his will. So God does love us despite the way we are. And then you'll notice, and we'll see this theme in our three churches that we're dealing with today, the repeated refrain, the one who does what? Whoever comes, some versions translated, conquer. You may know that there's a famous shoe company that has its brand name based on this Greek word, Nike. I actually prefer not to give so much money for sneakers when I buy them. But uh, they're a popular brand, and, and you may know probably a legendary story, or at least have some legendary elements, that where this term is famous in history is when Phidippides ran the 26 miles, 385 yards from Marathon to Athens, and with his dying breath, he says, Nikoman, Nike, we have won. We have overcome the famous battle between the, the Greeks and the Persians. And with his dying breath, he proclaims victory. Well, we serve one who doesn't require us to die in this life, but has died for us. And with his dying breath, he remembers said, it is finished. Victory. He provides a victory for us. So, so keep this in mind, the one who overcomes. And, and, and how is it that we overcome? Because this applies to each of the seven letters. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And verse 11. And they have conquered him. That's the word there. Overcome him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. In other words, their love for Jesus was the most important thing. They overcame in that way. And then notice the pattern of the letters as we begin reading them. Yeah? An introduction, these things says, and, and there's an address to the church which I said is the Christians at this community, a description of Christ that is borrowed from Revelation 1. In most cases, there's some praise, although not with Sardis and Laodicea. In most cases, there's some review, though not with Smyrna and Philadelphia, some counsel for them, a warning, 
and then it concludes with a promise. So that's the pattern that we will be looking at with our churches today. So with that, let's look at our Bible passages to consider. Who has Revelation 3, verses 1 through 3? And let me say how nice it is to have Joe Nixon back. We'll be teaching for Atlanta Adventist Academy this coming school year, but it's nice to have him back in the country and to have him as a guest at our class. And I know there are two people who are particularly thrilled to have him here. So welcome back from the islands where you've been teaching, and thanks for sharing Revelation 3, 1 through 3. Thank you so much. I read from the ESV English Standard Version. Jesus is speaking and says, To the angel of the church of Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you've received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Okay, and who has verses four through six? I just divided the letter into two readings. Yes, right back there. And Dick, it's nice to have you in class, and welcome to the area. Thank you. So I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Okay, a picture of Sardis, and by the way, the, the city in ancient times, the, the citadel, the defensive fortress was up on the hill. What you see in the foreground there is the Temple of Artemis in ancient Sardis, and it was quite a sprawling city that was spread out over a number of miles. And before we consider a few questions in connection with Sardis, a few things that help us understand some of the council in this letter, it was a very wealthy place, the capital of the Lydian kingdom of Croesus, known to be one of the wealthiest men in the ancient world. It was located on top of a steep hill overlooking the Hermes Valley. The largest building was the Temple of Artemis. So you can see how the cult of Artemis was spread around in various places. Of course, the, the well-known temple at Ephesus was one example of that. It was conquered in 549 BC by Cyrus and again in 218 BC because it was self-confident and wasn't vigilant. Hey, we've got strong walls around our city and, and we don't need to be on the lookout. And as we had said, no real words of commendation for the Christians at Cyrus. So what are your thoughts? What's going on at, at Sardis? What was their problem? How, how would you describe it and how one might we apply it to today? What's going on? Don't be intimidated. We all pay the same tuition here. <laughs> they the Wait, wait for the microphone, ma'am, because there are, there are people on the... By the way, we, we do want to welcome those who are watching online and who will watch later on. So, and if, if my mother happens to be among them, a shout out to Jane King at Kennesaw, George. Go ahead. Well, just to answer your question, I, I think they're they're hypocrites for one thing because they're acting one way, but they really are something else. Because it says, you know, they appear to be alive, but they're really dead. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes me think of sometimes reaching you're going to somebody's house and you're sitting there and they've got a nice plate of fruit on the table and you reach for it you bite into it but it's fake you know it's not real at all not that that's ever happened to me but i'm just saying <laughs> they're putting on um, something that really isn't real at all okay good anyone else what, what, what comes to you as you read this letter yes down here Had mentioned in the previous slide that Sardis was a, was a wealthy 
yeah. city. But I believe by the time that John wrote this letter was under the Roman Empire and not as wealthy as it used to be. Yeah. And so, you know, it seems like they're hanging on to their laurels a little bit, remembering how things were and how wealthy they were. Just have a description here by the Roman period, Sardis had lost its prestige in the ancient world while continuing to enjoy its prosperity and wealth in John's time. Its glory and pride was rooted in past history rather than present reality. Whoa, that's pretty a strong and insightful statement. Rooted in past history rather than present reality. Anybody else? Thoughts? Yes. I have a question. Wait just a second because we do have some watching online. And we all want to hear. I have a question. And um, the answer to it would be predicated on any input I would have. Is it correct that Artemis was about Diana, the goddess? Yes. That being the case, my thought is that they had also gone the route of goddess worship. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, Artemis is the Greek name for Diana, is the Latin name. So they're the same, same goddess. They would just adopt a different name if if they were Greek speakers and Diana was the Latin name. But yes, this was the, basically the fertility goddess. And of course, it, it seems to me, if you look at idolatry as a whole in the pagan world, that all of the attributes and the, the, the benefits and the gifts that our good God offers, that basically there's a counterfeit for that. And yes. That's true. And this female thing that seems to run through it with Jezebel Artemis and all this, there's goddess worship in there as well. Yes. In addition to the worship of Caesar. Mm -hmm. So we got a big mixture and a stew pot of stuff going on. Right. And, and you can see how um, if one believes in polytheism, it's, it's not a threatening thing in some ways. If you meet some other power or force that you want to include, you don't have to discard another one. You, you just embrace another god. And, and another one, and another one. And that's why it's so jarring, in fact, to the modern mind, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, that, that's an exclusive statement, is it not? And, and so that's what challenges us in the modern world as it challenged them in, in the ancient world. Because I could see the hand over here, Amari. I could see people say, oh, it's, you know, it's not such a big thing. Um, just go and offer a pinch of incense to, to Caesar. And after all, some might have said, we know he's not God anyway, but just, just go along with it. And, and you see, in some cases, their lives depended on their earthly lives, whether they went along with it or not. Yes. So just a comment on, on the Christ being the only way we often mean that in a very restrictive way. I'm the only way. And yet God, the Christ, is telling us, I'm the vehicle by which everyone comes to God. And I have been influencing everyone to come to God, whether it's through nature or whatever else. In Romans 2, you know, um, we, we come to God even not even knowing that, that who he is. And so, yes, Christ is the one, is the vehicle, but he's the representative of God's head, and he's the outreach vehicle. And so it's not, I mean, I think there's a comments from some of our forebears at this church who say that there will be people in heaven who've never heard the word of Christ before. Because they have been following the dictates of their conscience and the Holy Spirit has led them to God without them ever being introduced. Thank you. Um, any other comments on, on Sardis? I've got a comment back here in the back. Uh, it's not exactly about Sardis. If you allow me just to say something else. In relation to what you have just said. Now, Paul makes it clear, even in Romans chapter 2, some people are, will be considered righteous not knowing about Jesus Christ. But he makes it clear, it's all because of Jesus Christ. It is all because of Jesus yes. Christ. Jesus is the one who has reconciled heaven and earth. And, and, and I 
And let me just add to this in connection with service. Isn't it true that sometimes nowadays that individuals, churches, institutions can rely on a reputation, which to use the quote that Joseph read is not rooted in reality. Sometimes people will come and, and visit me and we have individuals coming from various places around the country to study theology to prepare for ministry here at Southern. And we're thankful for those students. And sometimes they have heard good things about our, our theology program. And I'm glad for them here to hear good things. But you know what is more important to me is that the reality that they experience on the ground be a positive one. That, that they be nurtured in their walk with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that their talents and abilities for serving him would be expanded during their time here. And so it seems to me that if we are following the leading of God and being blessed by God in that way, that reputations take care of themselves, do they not? And, and maybe sometimes individuals, places, can be more concerned about their reputation than with doing the right thing and what we should do in specific situations. Yes. I was just thinking of when a person was physically dead um, and relating that to what was this church actually doing? Were they becoming um, just kind of drowsy? Were, were they spiritually, we have to eat the food, you know, we have to read the word, we have to share what God is doing in our lives, exercise, you know, our faith. And so I'm just kind of wondering, was there anybody really there uh, doing what? So I'm just kind of wondering what what caused them to, what was it? Well, let me share a couple of things in connection with that. The story is that one time when they were conquered, it was because there was a soldier who was sitting up on the walls of the city and like he, he dropped his, his helmet or some part of his armor and it, it clattered down below and he didn't think that any of the enemy, that there were enemy soldiers camped outside the city. He didn't think any, that anyone saw him and he kind of went down a secret pathway to, to obtain that helmet that he had dropped. Somebody saw him do it and that night when they were sleeping inside the city, they didn't have the watchman as they should have, or maybe the watchman was sleeping and the city was attacked and defeated. And so it seems that, that the message to Sardis is, is purposefully building on that, that they are not spiritually alert. They are sleepy. Or if you look at it, it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, there's a little bit of a paradox or an incongruity in this letter because if they're dead, then they're a corpse, right? It's You do a post-mortem. Right? It made me think of, you know, the Miracle Max and the Princess Bride. If you don't know about it, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually this week, I'm not playing for you, but I actually played the clip. You can see the 30-second clip where he says, mostly dead is slightly alive. <laughs> And, and like I said, if you don't know about it, it's something that's crept its way into popular, popular culture in, in America, and I just thought of that. But, but here's the good news about this. Um, Miracle Max says if, if they're really dead, all you can do is sort through their pockets and get the loose change. But, but the message, please note, the message in Revelation 3 is coming from the one who is the resurrection and life. And so even if they are dead, and like I said, there's a little bit of a paradox because then in verse 2 it says, wake up. How do you wake up if you're dead? The only way you can wake up if you're dead is if a life giver gives you life. Isn't that right? And, and so Jesus is offering to renew them spiritually, to give them new life. And, and, and he's willing to counsel them, to be honest with them. And, and isn't it true that if we go to whatever doctor it is, I, I'm thinking of a dermatologist because occasionally when you spend a lot of time out in the sun, particularly in your younger years with no sunscreen and all, you need to be checked. Are there spots developing with skin, uh, skin cancer and that type of thing? You don't want the doctor to give you a clean bill of health if he needs to take a few spots off of your body, do you? 
He wants the doctor to be honest with you. And so Jesus is the divine physician. And he's willing to tell them what they need to do. They need to wake up. They need to be ready. They need to know if there's a, they're in a, a serious situation. Yes, you know. You know, I grew up very poor and have felt most of my life. I've just been, um, you know, this hillbilly girl is just trying to keep up or, you know, and I, I would look at the comments in the Bible about pride and I would think, well, at least that's an area that I don't have to worry about. You know, that's not before. <laughs> but as I've gotten older and lived in this same community for almost 30 years now, um, it, it does matter to me. I do have a problem in this area and I, I'm realizing that I, you know, I, I want my reputation to be what I let people see, you know. I think um, maybe raising children brought that out more than anything else. You know, when they tell you now as young adults, you know, you were too hard on me or you were, you know, um, I I wanted them to look and be a certain way for the community to, you know, it wasn't always the, the um, for their good, you know, it was more for how it looked to other people. And not just in that other areas of my life, it's a, it's a struggle for me um, to not, um, to care more about what Jesus is seeing yeah. than what other people are thinking about. Nice, nicely stated. You know, it, it, there are, when you think about it, there are several aspects of what you might call self. There's the way we understand ourselves, or the way we see ourselves. There's the way that others <laughs> see us. And then there's the way that Jesus sees us. And, and the three will generally not coincide because sometimes we have the tendency of ourselves to maybe inwardly to we think of ourselves oh I'll be the first one to admit that I make a mistake if I ever should make one <laughs> <laughs> sometimes our attitude can be like that can it? And, and maybe that's why Ellen White says that that pride and self-sufficiency are the most incurable and deadly of all sins. I've noticed before that, that pride, the middle letter is I, that, that sin, the middle letter is I. Isn't it true that that's what is at the root of all sin when we put ourselves in place of God in our lives? And I just think of, of, of Sardis, how the Lord is speaking straight to them. They need to wake up. They need to return to what they had before. They have the reputation of being alive. But they are dead. Let's look at the promise before we move on to Philadelphia. Verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Isn't that beautiful? No white out use there for those who ever come. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. One of the things I would just remind you when you look at that promise and he who has an ear, let him hear. Notice that we are saved not as groups, not as a church body. It's the one who conquers, or let him who hears, right? These are individual decisions that we must make. It's, it's not a corporate decision, Doreen. Um, I just, when I hear you say <clears throat> him who conquers, it talks about a work. We don't like to hear that. We want to really embrace the grace aspect um, and not think about the things that we need to do to overcome. Um, so I was listening this week to something that I thought about all week long ever since. I was listening to National Public Radio, and there was a girl that was doing a reporter was doing an interview, the personal interest story, with this woman who had been very, very secular, was raised a um, Orthodox Jew, and then this person, this lady had since gone back and explored Judaism and basically had a reconversion experience. So this young reporter was interviewing her and she shared a bit of her own and she said I was raised 
Presbyterian, and I rebelled against it. I rebelled against the restrictions, and I guess I've been kind of eating at the spiritual buffet ever since. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about that for a little bit, and then the reporter comes back to the concept of a spiritual buffet, and she said, I guess when we pick and choose what we want to believe, we just become what social media has become an echo chamber. We just become more of who we are. And maybe that's what spirituality is meant for, to change and confront who we are and to change us. Yeah. And it was like, I thought about how much do I, even within my own Adventism, want to pick and choose and say, well, yes, I like this part, but that part I really don't like, and I don't think that still applies just because I am my own echo chamber. And I've just been thinking about it, and I think about it as I hear the word of the top. Right. Uh, thank you for sharing that. It, it seems to me that it's a perversion of grace to pit it against truth, that, that the grace that forgives also transforms. Amen. And we, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, maybe you've heard the little rhyme before, saved by grace, a wonderful condition. I sent all I want and then claim remission. That may rhyme, but it's bad theology because the Lord does want our lives to reflect his character and his glory in the way. Yes. I think it defines pretty well what it means by overcoming and conquering. Uh, first of all, up earlier, it says uh, you are, you're going to die for I have not found your works perfect before God. Mm -hmm. So they're doing things and I think it's good. Later on, there is a group that he does commend. He says, here's a group who have uh, not defiled their garments. And the note down here says that the faithful of Christ. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And we all know what white garments are. And then right after it says, he overcomes, shall be clothed in white garments. So overcoming is walking with me. Mm -hmm. the sequence right there. Yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's what it means to overcome, I think, in this context. Yes, and, and I like the, the word walk. It's a, it, it connotes the relationship that we have. Okay. Just a comment on, on your comment about the one that overcomes uh, that I don't want us to miss. I think what you started off with of uh, the letters going to college, you know, church, and then the good news out of school and family, and then down to individual um, is brilliant. Because uh, what I don't want us to lose is if we go back and look at every one of these letters to the churches, at the end of every one of them, um, he goes from the corporate to the individual, which I think is just, it's, it's brilliant. You know, for example, Laodicea, then he ends that letter with saying, I'm coming to the door and knocking. Well, the only one that can open that door is us individually. He goes from the corporate to the individual, and he does that with every one of the churches. If you go back and and read the text, um, which I think is is brilliant. You know, we can get we can we can talk about the corporate church and what its problems and stuff is, but it just behooves us to realize, like you said there, that it all comes down to the individual mm -hmm. and goes from corporate to individual. Yes. Okay, who has the reading in Philadelphia? We need to move on to to Philadelphia. Who has the reading for that? Right down here, Jeannie. In fact, there are two readings. Who has the second reading for Philadelphia? That would be uh, chapter 3, verses, let's see, 10 through uh, 13. Who has that second reading? Okay, so we'll get the other microphone there. Okay, Jeannie, you go ahead. The faithful church. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. 
Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Okay, go ahead. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven for my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Okay, so just a few things about Philadelphia, founded by Attalus III, named in honor of his love for his brother. They had experienced a devastating earthquake earlier in the first century. Sometimes the inhabitants there would stay outside the city because of aftershocks and their concern about the earthquake. And we said there's no word of rebuke to this city. So what speaks to you from the message of the church at Philadelphia? What, what stood out to you in this message? Anyone? Yes. It seems there's a promise for us in the last days, especially as was read in verse 10. My command to persevere, I will also keep you in the hour of trial. I don't know if you have comments on that, but that spoke to me when I studied it. Thank you. Anybody else on, on Philadelphia? I really like the verse that says, I know that you have a little strength. Yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. How many times do I feel like I have little strength, just barely holding on? But it's it's almost a commendation. You have a little strength, but I'm there for you. You know, and, and isn't it? Some of you maybe have run a 10k race or a bicycle race, or even maybe some people doing the uh, the Springs Triathlon or the Seven Bridges. And and isn't it nice if somebody else encourages you to hey, keep going when you feel like giving up? I had a funny situation. It was when Gordon meets us when they were celebrating his 70th birthday, and I went for the bike ride, which ended up being about 78 miles. And, and I I felt like I was uh, about to give up. I was really tired and. And, and would you believe I saw Leslie Evanson, who works at the gym, and I think she was about seven months pregnant at the time, riding her bicycle. And I thought, you know, if she can keep going on this, I can too. <laughs> that encouraged me a little bit. Keep going, Rick. You can do this. And, and so isn't it interesting to, to know that the Lord wants to encourage us Yes, you have a little strength. Keep going. In. And I don't want to miss as we come towards the end of these letters. Look at the promise in verse 11. I am coming soon. Just about a week ago, I had the privilege of visiting with, with Jack Blanco. And Jack's mind is, is struggling. He's had, I think, maybe a couple of strokes and so forth. But when he is at his most lucid, this is touching. Is when he's talking about the Lord. And so I visited with him for a little while, and, and, and there's a lack of clarity about some things, but his, his face took on an eagerness, and he said to me, this was just last Sunday, he said, Craig, what would it be like to see Jesus face to face? What would that be like? And you can tell it's a, it's a present reality with him. And, and, and then a little later in the conversation, Craig, when do you think the Lord is going to come? I said, well, Jack, I, I don't know that, but I do know he wants to be us to be faithful each day until that time. And as I, as I went away from this visit where I'm trying to encourage him and have prayer with him, I leave encouraged because his, his mind is so focused on eternal things, eternal realities. As I said, he said it's his clearest when he's thinking about the Lord and praying to the Lord. 
This is one when he speaks most clearly. And so that is a precious promise. I am coming soon. Okay, let's turn to the message of Laodicea. Who has the reading? Okay, and there should be two people with that, Valerie, and then who has the second reading on Laodicea? That one get handed out? It would be uh, Revelation 3 and verses, about verses 18 through 22. You ready to that one? Oh, over there. Okay, so Valerie, go ahead first. And to the angel of the church, the Laodicean, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich with white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye salve that you may see. Okay, go ahead with the rest of the message. Hilarious. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, it, it makes me in some ways want to just spend a whole week, a whole series of sermons dealing with these seven churches and, and particularly with Laodicea, located on a major trade route, an enormously wealthy city. By the way, in, in connection with what Tina said earlier about growing up poor, have you noticed that, sadly, and, and maybe none of us in this room think of ourselves as rich because uh, we know of people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and, and BlackRock and, and all of that, but, but isn't it true that compared to the world standards, if we had a roof over our head last night and had some food to eat this morning, that, that we're better off than a large percentage of people? But have you noticed that sometimes there's an inverse correlation between spiritual commitment and material well-being? between prosperity and spirituality, that sometimes as we gain more and more of this world's goods, we sometimes feel that we need God less and less. And that's, that's sad. Laodicea, enormously wealthy city, famous for a glossy black wool that was used in making high quality garments, a banking center where a large quantity of gold was stored. You may know that still half of the gold owned by the US Treasury is at Fort Knox, not too far away from here, had a medical school. So it was it was Fort Knox and Loma Melinda combined, right? Uh, had a medical school, which was renowned for its treatment of eye disease with a special ointment. You see how these parts are, are fitting into the letter. Water from the nearby hot springs was lukewarm by the time it reached Laodicea. And no words, commendation for the Christians at Laodicea in this letter. So what is the main problem here? How would you how would you summarize it? There are different ways you could express it. What would you say is the main problem of Laodicea? Apathy. Apathy. Good. What else? Comfortable. So comfortable. Don't recognize any need that they have. Yes. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that the spirit of this is kind of a sort of a spiritual blindness you know, mm -hmm. in the sense of not really understanding even that they're in a bad condition. So yeah. they think everything is fine. Mm -hmm. They've got everything they need. 
you know, and uh, I think they're right with God too. In the midst of all this, everything seems okay, you know, yeah. but they don't realize they're poor, blind, and naked. So to me, that's really glaring, you know, and, and amazing. I think a bit of that condition, I think it says a lot sometimes about you know, again, the days we're living in. So. Yeah. Uh, good, good thought. And, and maybe this is helps us understand why he said, I wish you were hot or cold. This is generally understood hot would be on fire for God, excited about God, cold, uh, not any relationship with God. Why would he say that? Someone might ask. I, I think of what Philip Yancey says in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. He's talking about how sometimes people that have made real mistakes in their life, at least they recognize a spiritual need. He says, the prostitute has many problems, but being satisfied with her life is probably not one of them. Is it true that sometimes we can have a sense of self-satisfaction and, and like Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel chapter four, it's not this great Babylon that I have built. Uh, look at what I have done with my life. If you examine Isaiah 14, we don't have time to look at it now, but it's, it's, it's speaking of Lucifer, the son of the morning. I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be like the most high. Some have pointed out that Lucifer had eye problems. He couldn't see past himself. And, and sometimes that can be true with professed Christians in the modern age. What else about Laodicea would you like to highlight? What, what speaks to you from this message to the church at Laodicea? Okay. As quickly as you mentioned, this is the worst diagnosis mm -hmm. of any church. It's it's a it's a long diagnosis as well. But it seems to me what spoke to me was the promise to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. To me, what that says, as bad as the diagnosis is, the promise is even better. Yeah. Yeah, that, and I where sin abounds, grace abounds even much more. I, I like that, Joseph. And from the part of the world that your family is from, you might also highlight the, uh, it, he opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. When you have table fellowship with someone, it's, it's an intimate relationship. It's not a drive-through meal that is being talked about, but it, it's talking about deepening the relationship. And then when you think about it, to sit with Jesus on his throne. The one who sits on the throne is the what? The king. That's the one who sits on his throne. And it makes me think of, of Romans chapter 8, where, where Paul says that we are fellow heirs with Christ. That, that we are the recipients of, of promises that, that God gives to his son. What a phenomenal promise this is to sit with him on his throne is talking about authority and access and, and and there's something that's just magnificent and thrilling about this promise so i like the way you state it is as bad as the indictment is the promises are even greater so anyone else have something that you'd like to share on layer to see something that sticks out at you about how this might apply to us and and i think it's important to do that yes Thanks, honey. Um, one thing I was thinking about is just the word bamboozled. I think that's a word. Um, here you have people that think they have it all, but the stark reality is just the opposite. They're wretched, they're naked. Um, some of the scenes I think of is the demonic, you know, hanging out in the dead tombs and cutting on himself and, and, and being. Um, just kind of a walking corpse, and Jesus goes through the storm to save him. And then along with that, I think about the upside down mentality we have now, where people are going to doctors to cut off parts of their body because they don't realize that they're whole and complete in the body that they're born with. And just the um, being bamboozled into thinking things that aren't true at all, kind of, um, just grasping the fake and, and not realizing what's real. And all of that sickness and horror um, is being revealed in the book. And the Lord says, 
is this what can happen? You can sit with me and be a new person. Yes. Hold on to that microphone because I'm going to have you uh, lead out in the song in just a moment. But before I come over to you, let me just mention you, you mentioned the wretched and miserable. As my colleague, Dr. Broski, could point out to us, the word wretched is only used in one other place in the New Testament. And you might be able to think of where it is. Oh, wretched man that I am. This church, these professed Christians are in bad shape, are they not? It's sort of like the parable that you heard about the emperor that has no clothes. He thinks he's, he's, he's going down the street in the parade with the, the garment from the magic loom, and he thinks it's wonderful and beautiful. And finally, the little child blurts out, the emperor has no clothes. This church has no garments, right? I mean, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, and it thinks it's rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing. I don't know of any church that has a greater gap between the reality and what it esteems itself to be. And yet Jesus doesn't give up on this church, does he? Yes, go ahead. We had the privilege of visiting this site um, with you on a trip to the Turkey. Yes. Etc. We had a nice time, didn't we? Yes. Um, the thing that I was most impressed with, like most of the towns were abandoned, and I understand that. But the thing that most impressed me about this site was the water pipes. The water pipes were completely uh, solid. They had silted in so that there was no ability to get uh, nutrition through those water pipes. And I think that could be true of my religious life. If I don't keep the avenues open, then I might become just as barren and uninhabitable in a spiritual manner as this town had become. Great application in that the, the living manna needs to come to us every day, doesn't it? This is one of the more famous portraits in the world. Jesus, the light of the world. Uh, the artist was William Holman Hunt. There are about three versions of it that he did. The largest one hangs in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Some of you may have seen it there before. Um, it's considered to be, this is how St. Paul describes it, is the most troubled artwork in history because in the early 1900s, they took it around and put it on display at various places and people would pay just to see this portrait because it was considered to be a sermon in, uh, a, a sermon on canvas. And you can see the door overgrown with weeds. Does that happen? That ties in nicely with your application. The, the pipes that were encrusted, not allowing water through. The door is, is overgrown with, with weeds and no doorknob on the outside. What does that symbolize? That if the door is to be open, it has to be open from within. But you know, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus stands at the door what tense is that english grammar students present tense stand at the door i am standing at the door and knocking linear action ongoing action when someone knocks at the door it means they want they want to come in they want to enter our heart there's another picture of it jesus knocking at the door so I'd like to conclude today, and if you know the song, please join in singing with Mary as she leads us out, and the Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to it?
therefore, these messages to the churches are, are sometimes strong messages. They're racy messages. They're tough messages. But we thank you for speaking to us truthfully with what we need to hear. We're grateful that your spirit brings conviction and, and at times challenge even as you invite us into a closer walk, a deeper relationship with you. Lord, as we walk from this room, may that image of you knocking at the door of our hearts, may that linger in our minds. You say, if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, Lord, we want to open to you today and tomorrow and the next day. And we also want for our loved ones, our, our children, our students here on the campus of Southern, we want them to hear your voice, to open the door. We thank you for the promise that we can share eternity with you, sitting with you on your throne. May that day be soon, that day to which Jack Blanco looks forward. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, last week, you know, we were looking for a place to have a potluck, and uh, we now have one thanks to Phil Garber and Greg King. It's going to be right next door. Um, so, uh, Joni will, I'll send out an email this week. If you're not on our email list, come up and I'll put you on it. Uh, send out an email. Uh, she'll let you know what it is we need and whatever the theme August is going to be. Five. August 5. It's going to be August 5. The other thing is our, our lessons are all now on YouTube under Good News Sabbath School. So if any of you want to see them, and next week is Revelation 4 and 5. So thank you all for coming and have a great week. Thank you.